Oh yeah. Um, so finally, we have uh, Dr. Graham Morphy with us. You know, um, I don't think our audience needs any introducing. You know, with Graham, like, with Graham Morphy, because you know we we constantly cite your works, and you know we we're a huge fan of yours actually. Um, actually, I'm a big fan of your approach, your way of looking at naturalism and these the theory based. You know. Um, approach towards philosophy of religion. So yeah, I mean, I constantly refer to your work and you know do videos about your work and so on. So you know our our audience are pretty familiar with you and your works actually. Um, so do you want to give a brief intro about yourself? You know how you got into philosophy of religion. You know. Okay, so I can do that. So um, these days I'm professor of philosophy at Monash University in Melbourne in Australia and I've been at Monash for 25 years and during that time I've mostly taught philosophy of religion so um, how I how I got to philosophy of religion is kind of a long story uh, I was interested in arguing about religion with people when I was in high school and um, I've when I went to university, I studied philosophy and history and philosophy of science and maths and physics. Uh, I was an undergraduate for quite a while. Um, and then I did, did a PhD in philosophy of language. And I kind of came back to philosophy of religion sort of by accident. I came back to Australia after I finished my PhD and um, an opportunity to teach a course in philosophy of religion came up and I accepted it and it was really when I did that, when I taught that course, that I taught myself a lot of philosophy of religion. And it eventually led to my actually shifting away from philosophy of mind and philosophy of language and working mostly in philosophy of religion. Yeah, so basically when we, we were, you know, quoting your works, uh, we got a lot of criticisms from the atheistic community itself. Uh, like, who cares about philosophy right now? We have science. So uh what's your view on this like uh what if somebody asks you what is the relevance of you know philosophy of religion uh what is your take so i think there are lots of different ways of studying religion that are that all have certain kinds of merits and it really depends what you're interested in i think that to get a well-rounded view of religion you need to study history, but you also need to study sociology and politics. Um, there's a whole lot of things that feed into it. Uh, but if you're interested in arguing with people about religious views, then you'll find yourself at a disadvantage if you don't um, familiarize yourself with philosophy of religion, because an important part of philosophy of religion has been trying to negotiate the differences of opinion between the various different religions and the various different non-religious worldviews that there are as well. Uh, you can't, I mean, even if you thought that you could kind of learn everything that there was useful to know about religion just by doing sociology or politics, uh, which is implausible, but even if you thought that, that wouldn't tell you how to how to effectively get other people to agree with you. Yeah, okay. So uh, basically you're saying that if uh, if you want to argue about God or assess the merits of a, a worldview, you should eventually look into philosophy of religion. So I think so. Um, it's, I th this is tricky, right? So if you think about, say, doing physics, you don't have to do any philosophy in order to do physics and do it well. You can decide that you're going to spend your life studying, say, classical mechanics and working on, because there's lots and lots of unsolved problems in classical mechanics. You could work on problems for the rest of your life and questions about philosophy might never come up. Um, we kind of know a lot about classical mechanics and we know a lot about the methods, but there's other areas of physics where 
we don't know so much and where we're not sure what the right methods are that we should be pursuing in order to solve the problems that we've got. So think about the conflict between the sort of incompatibility between classical between quantum mechanics and general relativity, we don't really yet know how we're going to deal with that. And so that brings that area much closer to philosophy. And the way that I think about philosophy, philosophy sits at the border of every discipline. And what's characteristic about it is that there's no expert agreement on the answers to the questions, and there's no expert agreement on the methods that we should use in order to try to answer the questions. So, um, Insofar as there's there are unanswered questions about religion and there are sort of disputes that we don't know how to resolve yet, you're going to need philosophy of religion. That's that's my view. Yeah. Um, so, um, do you want to lay out your approach um, towards naturalism and theism, and you know how you kind of approach these questions? Okay. So. And I guess the the bigger the, the at the sort of highest level, there's a kind of disagreement between naturalists and non-naturalists. And amongst the non-naturalists, some of them are theists. So we can focus on theists if you like, but it's a kind of bigger dispute. Uh, the way that so so by naturalism, I mean very roughly the view that um, the only causal stuff is natural. And by the natural, I mean the stuff that's properly, properly studied by the sciences, roughly. So properly studied by physics, chemistry, biology, but also sociology, politics, history, and so on. So the, the way that we work out um, what the natural entities are is just by looking to consensus in the sciences about um, what things there are that they can study, right? There's no science of God. There's no science of demons, right? They just aren't such things, right? <laughs> and, and they aren't going to find any place in a worldview that says that um, the causal things are things that are made from electrons and protons and um, elements and molecules and proteins and so on in that kind of picture picture of space time and what's in it you just don't find um gods or demons or angels or whatever at least so, according uh, to the sciences yeah so uh usually we get uh questions like uh oh you're saying uh naturalism all about you know what science finds and science presupposes naturalism mm -hmm. so it's kind of circular um and there's no clear definition of naturalism uh so how would you respond to that question so i don't think that people have much difficulty working out which things are natural and which are not you give them a list and on one side of the list you've got um i don't know electron um carbon um koala and on the other side you've got god devil um, and angel, right? And then you say, so which ones are natural and which ones are supernatural? And 100% of people can pass this test, right? So I just think that we have a really solid grasp of the distinction between the natural and the supernatural or the natural and the non-natural. And I, although maybe we don't want to go into this too much, but um, the worry about definition of sort of giving necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be natural uh, is one that I'm inclined to just sidestep by pointing to the history of 20th century philosophy and the failure of attempts to give necessary and sufficient conditions for things like knowledge, causation, work of art, and so on, and say nobody concluded that there's no knowledge or there's no um, causation or there's no works of art. So what? <laughs> what's the problem here? That that's the way that I'd be inclined to respond. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you there. You know, um, because I think the scientific picture of the world kind of gives you a rough idea about what entities are natural and what are not, right? So you just have to have a good understanding of the sciences and you would be fine 
with classifying what's natural and what's not natural. So, yeah. so there are other things that I might say. Uh, I might say, look, in ultimately, it's going to be the completed end of science that's going to uh -huh. make the determination. But yeah. we don't have that. What do we? What we do have is current science as a guide to what kinds of things are likely to be in the completed the completed science. There's no indication that there are going to be gods or demons in there. But what what there will be in there is you know, evolutionary theory and um, particle physics and a whole lot of stuff like that, right? So, so I think this is just agreeing with what you said, right? We we really do know what the, the, the what the kind of science based distinction between the natural and the non natural amounts to. Yeah. So, um, you know, you have a so usually the approach that most people take towards, you know, the arguments for God or, you know, arguments for atheism, the idea is pretty much, you know, you have a deductive argument, you know, the premise, premise, conclusion, you know, the airtight argument like Will and Lynn Craig and, you know, Adam Plantinka and so on, you know, you have these deductive arguments, but you have a different kind of approach towards, you know, these arguments and stuff. Do you want to expand on that? So, so I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to say about this. Um, I think that uh, when someone gives you an argument with a set of premises and a conclusion, it's kind of inevitable that their argument's not going to do what they want it to do. Um, so if you imagine a dispute between a theist and a naturalist, so William Lane Craig, and he gives you the Kalam cosmological argument, if you're a naturalist, you look at the argument and you say, well, I don't believe that premise. Pick one of his premises. I don't believe it. And as far as his argument's concerned, that's it, right? It's all over for the argument now. Um, what we really want to do if we're going to make progress is we want to look at the theories that we accept and compare yeah. them. So he's got a theistic theory of a particular kind. I've got a naturalistic theory of a particular kind. What we'd like to know is who's got the better theory. And in order to do that, we just need some criteria for assessing the virtues of theories. Um, we need to make some sort of decision about what the relevant evidence is that we're going to be appealing to when we're comparing the theories. But in my view, um, that's what you do. And the giving of arguments is, is actually kind of, it turns out to be, well, in, in that sense, the premise can conclusion conception of argument, they just turn out to be a waste of time. That's not to say that when someone tells you something, there's never a use for an argument. If they, if they make a series of claims and they're inconsistent and they can't see it, right, then a derivation can be really helpful to them. You know, an argument can be really helpful because you can set it out. You can say, look, you accept these things, but you get absurd consequences from accepting those things. That's a valuable use of an argument. It gives them some work to do. And the kind of more general case, if there are unnoticed consequences of your beliefs, it's helpful to have that drawn to your attention. An argument can do that. But as far as the business of persuasion goes, argument really shouldn't get you anywhere at all because the real question is, okay, who's got the better theory? And yeah. The, the standards for assessment of theory are just different from the standards of assessment for arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so if, um, you, you talked about the theoretical virtues, right? So I, I want to really get into that, right? So let's just say you're comparing naturalism and theism, right? You, you're a naturalist, so you obviously think that naturalism is better than theism in some respects. Right. So what are the criteria you use to, you know, kind of make that assessment? What are the theoretical words you yeah. use that you look at? Too? OK, so to start with, we need to decide what the evidence is that we're going to assess the two theories against or the two worldviews against. I'm just going to take the evidence to be everything we agree on. Right. That might sound fairly dramatic, but actually it turns out not to be. Um, that's just because one of the questions is going to be how well everything else fits with the evidence, right? How, it, what, how, how much do we explain? How well do we explain the evidence? That's one of the virtues of a theory. Um, and I think the other virtue of theories is how simple 
is the theory. So what does the theory commit you to? So if you're comparing two theories and one of them's simpler and it explains more than the other theory, then obviously that's the theory that you should be going with. And that, I think, is closely related to Occam's razor and closely related to kind of um, principles of theory choice in science that people have operated with for a long time. Right, so in general, what we're doing is there's this sort of trade-off between committing to as little as possible and explaining as much as possible. And the theory that we should be accepting is the one that's doing best at managing that trade-off. It's often hard to tell, but there are clear cases like the one I started with. If a theory is simpler and it explains more, as for example, I'm going to say is true of Einstein's theory is against Newton's, then obviously you pick um, the one that's simpler and explains more. The notion of simplicity is tricky because lots of people have been brought up to think that Einstein's theory is much more complicated than Newton's, but that's not really true. What's true is that you need a certain amount of mathematics in order to represent Newton's theory at all. And then you needed a lot more mathematics in order to represent Einstein's theory. But once you've got that more mathematics, you can write Newton's theory and Einstein's theory in that mathematics, right, the more complicated mathematics. And once you do that, you see that actually Einstein's theory is simpler and it explains more, right? So I think of that as a kind of clear case that just illustrates the way that I'm thinking about theory choice. Yeah. So um, I have a few questions regarding, you know, your idea of how, how we should evaluate, you know, theories. So you have simplicity and then explanatory power. You yeah. Know, so what are the components that go into explanatory power? You know, what are we looking at? Yeah. So I was thinking of just having an explanation, right? I'm think because I'm thinking that the other things that you might think belong in there will actually end up in simplicity. Right, so you might think that what you want is unifying explanations, but that's just going to mean that over on the side of the kind of axiomatization, you've got a lot of compression, right? You, d you don't have very many axioms. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that the only thing that really goes into the explanatory, into the kind of breadth and depth of explanation side is just having an explanation. And then yeah. there's a question about how fully it's explained, whether you've got... so. Um, so some things, if you've got indeterminism in your theory, right, you have some explanation of why something happened, but there's something that's just kind of brute in there as well. Suppose it could be that you would get either A or B from C and you actually get A. Mm -hmm. Well, why did you get A rather than B from C? No answer. Why did you get A? Because it's one of the things that you could have got from C. So you've got a partial explanation, but not a full one. So if there was disagreement about how much indeterminism there is, it would be better to have less indeterminism rather than more, because more stuff would be explained. On the other hand, if we've got, as I suspect we do, good reason to think that quantum mechanics means that there's quite a lot of indeterminism, well, that's just the kind of, <laughs> that's just how it falls out. That's the best theory that we can have. Yeah. Um, how, how does this fit with when you are discussing physicalism and idealism? Because uh, a lot of times the idealists would say that, hey, we have a simpler theory. Everything is just experiences or just consciousness and uh, you have two types of things. You have consciousness and physical, so you have more commitments. So, so this is a good question. Um, I think that it's important that the, the notion of simplicity here is not um, completely simple, right? So there's several different kinds of simplicity that matter. One of them is going to be, we imagine that you've got a theory uh, and you can axiomatize your theory. The simpler the axiomatization, the better, right? So we have to, one of the things that we have to be thinking about is, so what primitive theoretical commitments have you got in your theory? What things go unexplained, right? Because that's 
a way of thinking about axioms is they're the things that go unexplained. Everything else follows from the axiom, so it gets explained. Now, if you think about idealism and you think about um, the way that you just described it, so it's just we're just thinking about a person and their experience, then every single one of their experiences is a brute, unexplained fact in this theory, right? There's Whereas for a naturalist, the experiences all get explained in terms of perceptions of the world. So you've got a world, and there's interactions between the observer and the world, and you end up with a lot less primitive stuff, right? What you really need for naturalism is a bunch of laws and a bunch of initial conditions back at the Big Bang, and if it's deterministic, that's all you need, right? Whereas the idealist theory is just postulating a whole lot of separate um, um, primitive facts. You had this experience, then you had this one, then you had that one, then you had this one. No explanation about where any of them are coming from. That's a much more complicated theory, right? Yeah, I agree. It's so, about as complicated as a theory can get. So it's about as bad <laughs> as a theory can get. Yeah. That one. So, so you might try to solve this a little bit. You might say, but hang on, I'm going to postulate a God who's feeding you the experiences, right? So now I've got an explanation. But the explanation isn't just that God exists. It's, the explanation has to be something like this. Right now, God wanted to give you this experience. And then God wanted to give you this one. And then God wanted to give you this one and so on. And so you end up with a theory that's pretty much as complicated as the one without God in it. You've just got all these postulates about the experiences that God's feeding to you. So it still doesn't compete with the naturalistic um, theory, which ultimately gives you some simple laws and some initial conditions and gets everything else out of those. It's, it's a common response by the theist side, right? So just as you mentioned, you have the idealists trying to explain you know why you have these and these experiences and and their explanation is god just chose you to chose to give yeah. you that that experience right right now i'm interviewing Graham Offie because god chose me to have that experience right and and then you know obviously the choi choices are brute right they don't have an explanation but then a, a common theist response is that no i mean they do have an explanation. God's choices have an explanation, and that's just God. God explains his choices. It seems right, and and that seems clearly false, right? I mean, if you try to write it down as an explanation, so you know, why are you having this experience now? And someone says because God. I think that doesn't amount to an explanation at all, right? There's lots of other explanations that God presumably could have given you, why did you get this one rather than the others? You gave me precisely zero explanation. Mm -hmm. right? so, do, do you have a do you have an idea about what you're referring to when you're talking about an explanation? Do you have a view um, on that? So I think there are different kinds of explanations. So um, but I uh, one thing that will definitely count as an explanation is um, it, so I'm thinking about the the old covering law model of explanation that some somebody like Hempel had. If you know what the if you've got a deterministic system and you know what the initial conditions are and you know what the laws are that govern its explanation, then you can appeal you can explain its state at any point by saying it evolved to this state from these conditions under that law. And that would be a complete explanation. Right? So that's one kind of explanation that you can have. But some features of the world don't have that sort of prior conditions and laws explanation. So, for example, I believe that this is true, that at any time there's at least one pair of antipodal points on the Earth that are at the same temperature. Right? So there'll be... Somewhere there'll be some pair of points that are at that are directly opposite to one another and that are at the same temperature. This is just a, the result of an, a mathematical theorem about distributions of continuous quantities on a sphere, right? So it's a kind of structural explanation. Why is it that right now there's, there's a pair of points where the temperature that are directly opposite each other that are at the same temperature? Well, it's because of kind of 
it's, it's because of this mathematical result. That's what explains it, that a continuous quantity on a sphere, you have to end up with a pair of um, antipodal points that are at the same value, whatever the continuously distributed quantity is. Right, so that's a different kind of explanation from the um, initial conditions and laws explanation. And maybe there are other kinds of explanations as well. But I guess what you want is some, is some sort of account that we can agree is a full account of why right now this thing is this way rather than some other way. Yeah, I, I want to get into, you know, the ideas of partial explanations and stuff like that. But then I think, you know, um, I want to take the discussion into another direction, right? I think we can get to the partial explanation and, and that bit later when we get to the contingency arguments and that kind of arguments. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, what about simplicity? What, what are the uh, criteria that you are looking for when it comes to, like, simplicity? So what makes a theory simple will be, I think, so I, so I go backwards and forwards a little bit on this. I, th I can see that there are three things, but I'm not sure how independent they are from one another. So one is going to be the simplicity of the axiomatization, small axioms, not many of them. Another one is going to be how many undefined um, predicates or undefined terms you have in the formulation of the theory. And the third thing is going to be the number of entities and the number of kinds of entities that your theory requires. Uh, some of that's controversial. Some people think that the number of entities doesn't matter. It's just the number of kinds of entities that you should be worried about. Uh, and maybe that then just turns out to be a worry about sort of the, the mm -hmm. number of undefined terms that you've got. But it's so, but to be on the safe side, I mention all the things that I think are relevant. So it's those three things, the, the kind of minimal ontology, minimal ideology, and kind of minimal axiomatization. You want all three of those um, as factors in um, simplicity. Maybe you only need one. Maybe the only thing you need is the simplicity of axiomatization. I'm kind of undecided about this. But, um, uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So have you, have you tried? Okay, let me write some axioms for naturalism and see. <laughs> or... So 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 you can, that's pretty hard to do, right? Okay. For two reasons. One of them is because when because um, I don't have don't a kind of I don't have a finalized view. But the other thing is even um, for the view that I've got, it's enormously complicated. So. In my debate book with Kenny Pierce, it takes about, I think I spent about 90 pages just setting out some of the views that I think belong to my naturalism. And it will be very hard to axiomatize that view. Right. So, yeah. um, so, I mean, the short answer to your question is no, I haven't tried to, yeah. <laughs> to axiomatize my views, and I don't think that people can. Okay. So, if, yeah. if somebody asks you if you have an infinite causal reality versus finite causal reality, which one is simpler? One has yes. a necessity, and the other one is like, hey, it goes on. So, so, that's also a good question. So, a friend of mine, Daniel Nolan, wrote a paper back in the 90s where he argued that um, fewer entities is simpler and so he would say definitely the finite model is simpler than the infinite model i'm inclined to think that's probably right um that that that, that the number of entities does matter um yeah yeah 